Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am delighted to be joined today by Kristen Godsey. She is professor of Russian and East European studies at the University of Pennsylvania, author of books including Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic independence, and most recently, the book Everyday Utopia, What 2,000 Years of Wild Experiments Can Teach Us About the Good Life, available from Simon and Schuster. Professor Godsey, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thank you so much for the invitation. So let's start with the word utopia. Let's start with the concept of utopia. A lot of people are suspicious of utopias. A lot of people see even the word utopian as a pejorative or a negative descriptor of any particular plan. You say in your book that there is a, quote, persistent and profound suspicion of political imagination. So tell us first why utopian should not be a bad word. Yeah, I think this is a really important question because in so many other aspects of our society, we tend to laud those who think outside the box, those who engage in what is sometimes called blue sky thinking, right? Sort of the old Apple computer ads in the 90s think different, right? The people Mm. who imagine the world differently are the ones who are going to change it. And in the boardroom and corporations and academia and science, we really celebrate people who think different, who think outside the box, who think with no bounds to their imagination. But the minute we try to apply that thinking to our personal lives or to our social problems, then it's a terrible idea. It's scary. It's mm. unrealistic. And I think that that's a real problem. I think that the fact that we have limited our political imagination is part of what has gotten us into a kind of sticky mess right now in the early part of the 21st century in terms of lots of social problems, including the pandemic of loneliness and isolation, sorts of inequality that are endemic, economic inequality, gender inequality, racial discrimination, all sorts of other forms of discrimination that come out of a capitalist economic system, and also the climate crisis. I think that all of these are serious problems that require us to think creatively, and we need to shy away from our fear of utopian thinking. Your answer made me think that there really is a double standard. I thought back to all of the news headlines that have appeared over the last 15 or so years, every time Elon Musk says that we'll be colonizing Mars within two years, you know, that gets a news headline as if as if it's a realistic thing. But of course, and something... as if he doesn't think that we're going to be doing it as his indentured servants as well. Well, yes, right. <laughs> so what will the Mars colonies look like? And I certainly don't want whatever role I would have in one. But this idea that, you know, th- this kind, the Silicon Valley, the, what is sometimes called techno-utopianism, which often you posits totally unrealistic, you know, we're going to merge with machines and upload our consciousnesses, right. things we don't know how to do. But other things which we do know how to do are utopian and crazy and unrealistic. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, you have like the Coalition for Radical Life Extension, these people out in Silicon Valley who are basically trying to be immortal. And yeah, if you're talking about like, wow, universal healthcare, that's totally (laughs) utopian, but immortality is totally feasible. So (laughs) I think it's a really weird double standard that tech bros and billionaires and Saudi princes get to dream up line cities in the desert or like this new plan for Solano in Northern California, this utopian (laughs) city. But the rest of us are just going to be like stuck with a housing crisis and homelessness. And, you know, it's like, why can't ordinary people dream in a way that imagines a better future rather Mm. than just constantly ceding this territory of blue sky thinking to the tech bros and the billionaires and the Saudi princes who have the means, at least theoretically, to realize those dreams? We have the means to realize dreams, too, if we work together. We may not have their resources, but we have something else, which is power in numbers. 
Yeah, there are so many, uh, you know, kind of right wing utopias from seasteading to uh, uh, Ayn Rand's uh, Galt's Gulch, where all of the businessmen are going to go off and found their own community. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, you know, and I think it's really important to realize that part of the reason we have this weird kind of allergy to utopian thinking is because from a very young age, at least if you were raised in the United States or the United Kingdom, you're kind of fed a constant diet of dystopian literature, whether it's Lord of the Flies or 1984 or Animal Farm or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. In the United States, there's a book called The Giver, which is sort of perfectly attuned to tweens. We get fed a steady diet of dystopianism in literature and schools. And then if you look at our popular culture, things like the Hunger Games or Squid Games or Black Mirror, all sorts of shows that show us that the future is going to be this bleak, Mm. disgusting, awful place. And so (laughs) we might as well just like you know, enjoy the present. It may not be great, but it's better than what's going to happen if we try to change it. And so I do think we've been kind of drip fed from youth, a sort of fear of utopian thinking. And I'm not saying that there are some utopian ideas that we should be fearful. We shouldn't be fearful of. I mean, we have examples of people who claim to be building utopia and they went terribly awry. And I also want to be respectful of people who are afraid of charismatic leaders and cults of personality and things like that. Jonestown, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) We can't ignore those things, but there are so many other examples that I deal with in the book of perfectly ordinary people who decide for one reason or another to change their lives in a positive way. And what I think distinguishes my book from the kind of techno futurist utopianism that we often see in the public sphere about things like universal basic income, for instance, or universal inheritance, or, you know, open borders, 15 hour work week, sort of things that get discussed is that in my utopia, in my studies of utopia, I'm really interested in the ways in which people are reorganizing their private lives. And Mm -hmm. that's what I think makes this kind of a slightly different angle on this question. It certainly does. And I want to get to that. I just... um... Remember, as you were talking about the dystopian children's literature, there's a wonderful actually review of your book by the great Liza Featherstone in Jacobin. And she begins with these uh, these reading lists that I had in school too of of dystopias, and she says. She says this great quote. She says, when I was a kid, I assumed that this was because the adults in charge hated children and wanted to give us major depressive disorder. And she said, uh, we learned to recognize Newbery Award winning books as the sign that the book would be a relentless bummer. And uh, then you think that is so true, too. And I wrote a long article about Elon Musk a while ago. And what, what struck me was there were all these you know, he has all his fans and uh, there's even a children's book about him, I think called Elon Musk and the quest for a fantastic future. And the whole idea is that he's the, you know, he's the only one among us who is dreaming of a fantastic future. And I feel like, well, we can't cede that territory to him. (laughs) Absolutely not. Right. It's so important to realize that when we think about sort of ordinary things that we take for granted today, like no-fault divorce or daycare centers, childcare where you drop your kids off and a bunch of other adults look after your kids while you're at work. Those were initially utopian demands. And those were utopian demands that were realized by a bunch of people working together and putting pressure on society and reorganizing their lives in such a way that they made those things a reality. And so, yeah, to seed utopian dreaming of a better future to somebody like Elon Musk or anyone, really, it's not just him. It's anyone who mm. has the audacity to say, I'm the person who's going to bring you this future. That's a very dangerous thing. We need to decentralize and claim utopia for ourselves. You know, mm. understanding at the same time that utopia is always a horizon. It's not a place that you actually ever really get to. It's a place that you orient yourselves toward. And Mm -hmm. it's in the orientation towards utopia that you make forward progress, right? This is why Mm -hmm. Oscar Wilde said, a map that does not contain utopia is not even worth glancing at. Mm -hmm. Because there is something, you know, deeply moving even. I I feel it. You cite uh, in your book some of the Apple 
think different commercials as you've also mentioned you know the the think different commercial with all the fo- from all the pictures of the dreamers and it's uh you know it's gandhi and it's martin luther king and it's uh john lennon and and then they're like and the implication is and it's also steve jobs and now you should buy our <laughs> now you should buy our computer exactly. uh, but you, you feel that tug when you when you see it because this is a natural human instinct to long for and dream of this better tomorrow yeah absolutely i mean if you think about the when we think of visionary leaders of the past people exactly like gandhi or martin luther king or even somebody like john lennon right who spoke out against war and and you know was often a thorn in the side of the establishment i think we sort of what's the word we look up to those people because they were ideologically committed and brave. They Mm -hmm. took a stand. But if we actually look at them within the context that they were within which they were living, they were like persecuted and Mm. hated and derided by members of their society. Like we exonerate them after the fact. And, Mm. And I think that, you know, it's important to realize that behind the kind of visionaries that Steve Jobs wants to include himself among or wanted to include himself among, you know, are there were movements behind these mm. people. It wasn't just individuals. There were movements. If you think about Gandhi's salt march, right? Mm. 60,000 people were jailed for harvesting salt against a British law that made it illegal to harvest salt. Mm. And eventually, like the British just couldn't keep putting everybody in jail. It wasn't, yes, Gandhi led it. He led the initial march. He had the idea and he had the idea to resist nonviolently, but it was the people who joined him on that march. And it was the people who went out and openly defied the British law and collected salt that ultimately brought down, you know, the Raj. It it was this, Mm -hmm. it was an incredible act of mass solidarity around this leader. And it, didn't happen just because Gandhi said so. It's because there was something latent within Mm. that society that imagined a future without British imperialism. And I think that, you know, we can imagine futures without lots of things that we are currently putting up with today. What you've just been saying reminded me that uh, we had Robin D.G. Kelly on the program last year uh, to talk about his book Freedom Dreams, which had just been reissued. And one of the things that, that he says is that, you know, we consider social movements to be these very kind of, you know, kind of gritty, grounded things that are pushing for very particular policies. And it's 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 the difficult work of organizing. But he said that, you know, what we miss often about social movements is that they all have, you know, this incredible imaginative, you know, he describes it as utopianism in them. That is what that is often the animating spirit behind movements. He's trying to you know, really show us that side of quotidian kind of movement organizing. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a a wonderful book about black utopianism, for instance. And, you know, if you were a slave imagining a world in which white and black people were equal Mm. was completely utopian as Mm -hmm. a goal, right? I mean, there, that's why, you know, the, the original series of Star Trek was so shocking when they just decided to have a racially integrated crew, you know, in the future, this is just the way it's going to be, right? There's a way in which within all social movements, within all, you know, attempts to create a better future or to prevent a really awful future from coming in the case of climate uh, change and the climate crisis, There is a kind of core group of people. I sometimes like to call them the utopian 1%. There's a a (laughs) group of people who are just out there and they're not just dreaming of of a better future. They're actually creating that future in the present, what anarchists sometimes call prefigurative politics. Mm. They're living as if the future that they want to see is already here. And Mm. it's in people that are making those decisions about how they're organizing their lives, how they're treating their colleagues how they're being in the world that inspires other people to join them. And I think that's a really important force. And it's a force that we should, again, we should harness and not just cede to the tech bros and the billionaires and the Saudi princes who are out there trying to create alternative futures for us without our consent and without our, without sort of thinking about what is the best for humanity at large, rather than what is best for them as individuals. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I knew that it's, at some point Star Trek would come up because Star Trek comes up uh, repeatedly in the book. And perhaps you can tell us uh, why Star Trek has a, uh, has a place in this, in this book on 2000 years of utopian thinking. Yeah, I mean, so I start in many ways, this is a, a very capacious book. I start mm -hmm. in kind of Neolithic Tatahoyuk. I go through the Pythagoreans. Very few people know that Pythagoras was sort of the great, great grandfather of utopian living in many ways. And I kind of trace it through to the present day. And, and one of the things that I think is really important is the role of popular culture, of art, of literature, of cinema, of the ways in which we unbind our political imaginations from the present. And Star Trek has been a really important force in this endeavor, you know, for a relatively long time. It's certainly in popular culture terms for a pretty long time. And it's multi-generational, it's transnational. And I think that one of the reasons that Star Trek is set apart from so many other sorts of popular imaginings of the future is its relentless positivity towards mm -hmm. imagining a world in which a lot of the problems that we have today are just done with and gone mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. solved. And, you know, there's a, a quote in the book from Whoopi Goldberg, who was a character in The Next Generation and who had been a Star Trek fan when she was quite young. And for her, seeing Uhura on the bridge, seeing Uhura and mm. Michelle Nichols, the actress who played Uhura, you know, gave her hope that there were Black people in the future. These are her words, right? Mm. That's what Uhura did for her. And I think, you know, Uhura played an important role for many people. And all sorts of ways in which we, as I said, are just fed a constant diet of dystopianism about the present yeah. and about the future. And the best thing that we can do is imagine alternatives. And Star Trek is one of those alternatives that has touched a lot of people around the world and across the generations. Because it is true that when you start to see something depicted in fiction, this, 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 the, the world of Star Trek, and you see how it works and someone is imagining how this sort of thing could work. And then you see these imaginary, they're imaginary characters, but you see them acting it out. And there's sort of uh, a consistency to this world to the point where, at least in in your mind, this alternative, you know, totally imaginary world it takes on a kind of reality, it really does make you think, well, why wouldn't it sort of implicitly poses the question to you, the challenge to you, well, why wouldn't this be possible? Because if it's, you know, we're showing how it would work, so why isn't it possible? And then you go, well, maybe, maybe it is possible. <laughs> Right. I mean, Star Trek is sort of like a, you know, more than 50 year thought experiment in so many ways, mm. right? There, there are ways, like if you think about the question of scarcity. So in Star Trek, there are these things called replicators and basically whatever you want, you just walk up to a machine and you say, Hey, make me X, Y, or Z, in which case material possessions don't really matter anymore. Mm. And that's a pretty radical idea. If you think about it, especially living in the United States, the idea that your status as a human being would not in any way be reflected by your material possessions, not by your car or your clothes or where you live or what kind of phone you carry around with you. I mean, so much of our personhood building, especially I think for young people, is around consumerism and how we express our identities through the consumer products that we use and associate ourselves with. So if you take that away and you basically imagine a world in which everybody can have everything that they want whenever they want it, how are you going to differentiate yourself from other people? How are you going to be special? Well, you know, Star Trek says you might have hobbies. You mm. might actually, you know, improve yourself, learn languages, play instruments, join acting clubs, read poetry, whatever it is that you want to do, you're no longer going to be concerned with how you present yourself through material things, but how you are as a person through the things that you do and the relationships that you have with others. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting thought experiment. And Star Trek loves to do that kind of thing. And I think that it does get people to really think, wow, if I had to express myself, you know, rather than being a quote unquote personal brand, if I just was me, what would that look like? I think a lot of people don't even know how to answer that question without mm. the props of material culture that capitalism gives us. 
Now, I want to return to what you mentioned earlier, which is your book's focus on private life. You mentioned that obviously we have had in this country in the last few years, sort of since the Occupy movement, this kind of resurgence of you know, so- socialism and that incorporates your kind of utopian thinking. You cite some other books like, you know, fully automated luxury communism. But you say, and I just want to quote you here, but one of the, you say one of the most interesting aspects of this popular neo-utopianism lies in its primary focus on the public sphere. Today's future positive writers critique our economies while largely seeming to ignore anything that might be amiss in our private lives. But where we reside, how we raise and educate our children, our personal relationship to things, and the quality of our connection to connections to friends, families, and partners impact us as much as tax policies, the price of energy, or the way we organize formal employment. So through your book, you're not just talking about utopian experiments, but you have this this particular focus on on the sphere of the of the private. And uh, so perhaps you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah. So when I wrote Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism in 2018, I was really thinking about policies that could be implemented in a kind of traditional socialist way, like from the state, right? State provided universal child care and certain kinds of policies that would make it easier for families to raise children, health care being a big part of that. But these were all sorts of policies that had to be directed to and then granted from a receptive state. And After that book came out, I started to really think about, well, what happens when the state is not responsive or when Mm. you don't feel like you can actually democratically influence that state in any way for all sorts of reasons? Are there things that we can do in our private lives independent of the state that will start to get at some of these issues and that we have the full autonomy and ability to do right now, starting like today? So That's why I found these utopian experiments so interesting, because every single community that I looked at, trans-historically and cross-culturally, tended to kind of coalesce around a similar pot mix of policies about where we live, how we live, with whom we live, with whom we share our resources, and how we raise and educate our children. So for me, what I find really interesting is these kind of more futuristic techno utopias tend to really be sort of policy oriented about Mm -hmm. things that we can Mm -hmm. do in the formal economic sphere to make life more amenable to human flourishing. You know, what Noam Chomsky sometimes calls expanding the floor of the cage. And for me, I think I want to think about what is it about the family? And our relations with each other in our domestic private lives that is also playing a role in upholding this system. And are there ways if we start to change our domestic and private relations with each other that will ultimately kind of down the road impact the system itself. So Mm. this sort of bottom up again change that I'm talking about. And I actually think there's very good evidence to show that if we started living differently, if we gave up the idea of the nuclear family, if we gave up the idea that romantic relationships are the appropriate container for parenthood, if we gave up the idea of the single family home in the suburbs with our private car in which we commute to and from work, all of those things are pieces of an economic system that is exacerbating inequality, isolation, and loneliness, as well as the climate crisis. And so we can do things very specifically to reverse some of these trends by making changes in our private lives. Well, tell us a little bit more about the kinds of communities that you are profiling in this book and the ways in which living in them differs from living outside of them. Yeah. So there's a real range in this book. And, you know, the the extremes are going to be places like the traditional kibbutzim in Israel or or intentional communities like Twin Oaks in rural Virginia, or places like eco-villages like Tamara in southern Portugal, where you really have a group of people who are living together in a very communal way, and they're sharing property, and they're raising children in common, and they have a very sort of different view. And 
there are also religious analogs to this. Um, there are people like the Bruderhof uh, or the Hutterites. There are groups that are taking very seriously Acts 2 and 4 of the Bible, these verses where it says very clearly that the early followers of Christ, the disciples, shared all their property in common and lived together communally. You know, and then there are models like co-housing or even co-living, which is sort of a better mix, perhaps, of privacy and community where you might have your own private dwelling, but you're within, you're submerged within a greater community where there are sort of structured interactions with your neighbors and colleagues. And there are sometimes labor requirements. There are sort of more shared resources. And then there are just things like people who get a house together that are not related to each other, but they live together like mom unions, a bunch of single moms who will buy a house and raise their kids together. So, you know, this really runs the gamut. And I think that the key thing is that often these are what I call in the book and, you know, what they are called is non-consanguineous, but the better way of saying that is not blood related. So Mm -hmm. a group of people who are not necessarily related by blood or by legal family ties. So mom unions would be the best example. So four unrelated women, they're not sisters, they're not cousins. They're just four women who happen to have children without partners and they decide together to buy a house and raise those children together in that house. That is a model that goes back to antiquity, right? If not Mm -hmm. way before that. We know that we are cooperative breeders. We have often had other adults that are not blood related to our children in our lives. This may sound really radical, but in fact, some of the most traditional religious communities have godparents and godparents are often friends of the parents that are meant to play a really important role in the raising of children. So the pieces of this, the sort of target of my book is the idea that we have a nuclear family where the romantic relationship, usually but not always heterosexual, is the appropriate container for parenthood and that the biological parents provide exclusive biparental care for their biological offspring in a single family home surrounded by hordes of their privately owned stuff. That's the model that we think of today as the ideal family. Like you've Mm -hmm. made it. You're not a loser if you manage to do that. But it turns out that there are all sorts of people that would agree that, to quote David Brooks, the nuclear family was a mistake, right? There's a way in which this model of child rearing is really problematic because romantic relationships are fragile. And it turns Mm. out that child rearing actually makes them even more fragile. Mm. And so if that primary romantic relationship breaks up, then the children are kind of the collateral damage of the breaking of that relationship. And so if we submerged these relationships into wider networks, wider lateral networks of care and emotional support from other loving adults, these could be grandparents, these mm-hmm. could be aunts and uncles, these could be colleagues, neighbors, friends, these could be people from your religious community, these could be anybody, right? The idea is other loving, caring adults in the lives of children. It makes it easier for us to raise children. It's psychologically more healthy for those children. And it also takes pressure off of our romantic relationships mm-hmm. because we have other adults upon which we can rely on when the pressures of parenting become too difficult for us to bear. Yeah. When Sophie Lewis uh, it was on the program a few months ago and we were discussing this, one of the things that came up in that conversation is that uh, nuclear families guarantee inequality because they guarantee that how you do in life is everything's going to depend on the your luck in the parent lottery. And if you get bad luck in the parent lottery, it sucks for you. You know, but if you if you have those broader networks, as you say, you know, there's a cushion there. And even if you don't get the luck in the, in the parent lot, or you don't have the, the fortune to have, you know, parents who are loving it and devoted. There are other people in, in your lives who are. Right. It's not only that. Right. I also think that the nuclear family, as it is currently instantiated in most Western countries, is a primary node, if not the primary node in a capitalist society that allows for the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege, Mm -hmm. usually from fathers to their legitimate sons. 
Now, this predates capitalism. This is how it worked in feudalism. This is actually how it worked in antiquity during slavery. And the thing is that we often in our college years or in our 20s, we tend to live with a wider network of people. When we get older, many people move into like over 55 communities or senior living facilities where they live also with a greater number of other non related, non blood related adults. But it's only in this moment when we're raising children where we feel compelled to retreat into mm. the single family home in the suburbs or wherever, where we provide this exclusive biparental care to our offspring. Well, why do we do that? It's because parenting is like a contact sport. You know, mm. I'm a mom and I know that it's really difficult when you have a kid, you feel like you have an obligation to give them the best mm -hmm. life that you can give them, right? This is exactly this idea that, you know, if you win the parent lottery, you do well, but it's also that the nuclear family creates a situation in which other nuclear families are not your you know, uh, friends, they're your competitors, right? Mm. You're, you're all competing for scarce resources, right. educational attention, spots yeah. in good universities, you know, first violin and whatever, you know, orchestra your kid is playing. And, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which nuclear, the, the institution of the nuclear family creates competition mm. between parents and children. When, if we had a more capacious idea of family, a more cooperative view of child rearing, we would have much greater levels of equality in our society. The family would no longer play this primary role in facilitating the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. Yeah, it, it seems to me like a, a really important aspect of the kinds of communities that you're describing here is that the a big part of the purpose of trying to form them is is to make people's lives easier i mean it is so it's a more difficult to make friends it's more difficult to rear children when you're when you're just on your own um when you live in an isolating society and when we when we help each other uh, everything become everything becomes easier life becomes a lot less stressful and lonely yeah, I mean, it's not rocket science here, right? You know, this is why I think it's kind of funny to even use the term utopian when right. what I'm talking about is probably how human beings lived for millennia, right? Mm. And the idea is we would be happier. We would be more connected. Our children would thrive. Our societies would be healthier. We would have more community ties. There was a, a great I think it was in the Atlantic. Hillary Rodham Clinton recently wrote an article called The Weaponization of Loneliness. And she talked a lot about how loneliness is what fuels these conspiracy rabbit holes that people are going down. And they sort of end up in an alternate reality because they're so isolated from actual human beings and their primary social relationships are with you know, talking heads on the internet and, and conspiracy theorists and things like that. And so there's a way in which study after study after study shows that our weak ties, our community engagement are fundamental to our health and well-being. We know that loneliness and isolation, you know, they're saying now that it's like smoking 15 cigarettes a day, that the health, negative health effects that it has on our bodies. The Surgeon General is really concerned about isolation and loneliness in the United States and mm -hmm. what's going to happen to our public health. It's a public health crisis, not to mention the deaths of despair, the suicide, the opioid abuse, the alcoholism. There's so many negative downstream consequences of our isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And it's such an easy problem to fix. The thing is that we lit, we've inherited a built environment from the 20th century, from the Cold War. Our built environment is a big part of the problem. That's why the tech bros in Northern California want to build a new city for themselves to live in. One that has like all the amenities of being able to walk and having community interaction on a daily basis. While the rest of us, you know, inhabit this crumbling facade of pros American prosperity in the 50s and 60s or whatever. Mm. I do think that this is a, a key issue. And, and that's why I think the term that I use in the book is family expansionism. I think that we have to radically expand our definition of family. And this can mean chosen family, but this could mean extended family. 
This could also just mean creating lateral bonds to people. Hmm. The Russian theorist Alexandra Kolontai called this comradely love. And she believed that if we lived in a society with many more lateral ties of, with people who supported us emotionally and, you know, were basically there for us when we needed them and we were there for them, so many of the problems that we face in the present day could be eradicated just by increasing our social relationships with others. Now, uh, just to conclude here, I, I think we could dwell briefly on... Uh... You know, the, the common criticism of utopian thinking, the the Wall Street Journal actually read a review of your book, which I was surprised by, and they were horrified. Horrified, yes. They said, <laughs> they said oh, this is the revival of all this terrible utopian thinking that uh, ruined the 20th century and, and leads to authoritarianism and tyranny. And they said, this book is a reminder of why intellectuals should never be placed in positions of authority. But it got me thinking about this, uh, you know, I, I feel like that formula has it exactly backwards because you were talking earlier about, you know, the way in which the kind of techno-utopian capitalist stuff is imposed on us without our consent. And what you're talking about is finding ways to organize our communities democratically by choice, by free human choice, in, in ways that, that suit us, in ways that enable our flourishing us. So... Perhaps you could respond to this 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 common fear that and if any direction any attempt to sort of reorganize social life inevitably turns into the Khmer Rouge. Right. You know, I do think first of all there's an assumption that that's going to be a top-down reorganization. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I did feel that that Wall Street Journal review was quite disingenuous because right. <laughs> they were talking about top-down when my entire book was about bottom up. It's I sort of kind of made me wonder if they actually read the book or if they just sort of went off the blurb on the description and and my previous writing or something like that, because it's a very different book in the sense that I'm talking about things that we can do democratically together mm -hmm. to change the conditions of our daily lives in order to be more connected and contented with each other. But I do think that this sort of fear mongering, right, is precisely a tactic to get us to accept the status quo. Mm -hmm. So there's actually sometime soon, or if it just happened, a conference in Texas somewhere called Natal. It's a, it's a pro-natalist conference. And on their website, it says that because the population is declining in most advanced capitalist countries, economic systems that rely on continuous growth are at risk. Right. So there's a real fear right now because people are making independent decisions not to have children. And the declining birth rate around the world for people in power is really starting to worry them. That's why we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of rollbacks of, of previous rights that we had in terms of reproductive freedoms. There's a real fear that if people stop having children, we could be facing a degrowth future. Now, certainly from a climate perspective, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But the one thing that I think is really interesting about this is it assumes that there's only one way to have children, and that's mm -hmm. in a nuclear family, in your single family home, in the suburbs with your stuff in your car. And what I want to argue is that there are other ways. And, and I hear really talk about tri-parenting and multi-parenting. Why? We know economically that children who have two parents do better than children who have one. But why not have three mm -hmm. or four or more, right? Why doesn't that logic hold if we just expand the notion of the family? And so I do think that fear-mongering around any changes that we make to our private lives, especially around the family, is ultimately fear-mongering around our stability of our economic and political system. So even though they will, you know, claim that this is utopian and that this was unrealistic and, and these kinds of experiments always fail. They never work or they're a slippery slide to the gulag or something like that. At root, they're really afraid of them because if people wake up one day and just say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to live my life differently. This idea of prefigurative politics, I'm going to live my life in a way that doesn't participate 
in this sort of crazy consumer treadmill, the hedonic treadmill that social psychologists talk about. I'm going to live my way, my life in a way that shares resources rather than hoards them. I'm going to raise my children with a bunch of other people. I'm going to be happy and I am not Mm. going to allow the attention brokers to steal my eyeballs away from the people that are in my life that are making me happy. I think that that is a real threat to the system. And in this way, this sort of personal changing of your life is really profoundly political. Every time you hang out with a friend in the park or you drink a bottle of wine or have a couple beers down at the pub and you're happy and you're connecting with somebody, you are doing something really important. It doesn't feel like it, but it's very, very important and ultimately very political. Well, for a tour of various fascinating experiments in the pursuit of human happiness and flourishing across the continents, across 2,000 years, our listeners should pick up the book Everyday Utopia by Professor Kristen Godsey. It Anything that it's our position here at Current Affairs that anything that horrifies the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal must ha- be good, <laughs> and I can confirm that this book is in fact good. It can be bought from Simon and Schuster. Professor Godsey, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thank you so much for having me and for also recognizing that being panned by the Wall Street Journal is a great honor. Badge of honor. Badge of honor. (laughs) Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening. <laughs>